Well, good morning. I am very grateful to be with you all, to see, to hear what God is doing in this church. I'm grateful to worship with you, and it's a real privilege for me. I was uh, very happy to hear several months back that Pastor Jason was coming to your church. I've known about this church through my connections with Bethlehem, but I've, as Jason mentioned, I've known him for a while now, and I count him a friend and a brother, and I've seen his love for the church. I've seen his desire to see Jesus exalted, and I trust you all are seeing that now as he serves you as one of your pastors, and I'm praying for him. I'm praying for all of you uh, that you would care for him and his family well. I trust that you are. He is a gift uh, from God to this congregation. I'm confident of that. It's also, a, it was a treat to see Marty this morning. He uh, and I went to college together uh, 15 or more years ago. I'd have to do the math, along with uh, other Paganos and former Paganos. So it's, uh, it's cool to be with you all as well. And I also know that this church has uh, many connections to Bethlehem College and Seminary. So this is my first year teaching there, um, but I'm confident that Redeemer Bible Church and Bethlehem College and Seminary will continue to have a strong partnership in the months and years ahead. And so as we turn to our text this morning, which is Psalm 122, I want you to ask yourself where you find security, safety, peace of mind. It's almost a cliche to say we, we want these things, right? We all want peace, safety, security. Most of us probably lock our doors at night or lock our car when we park downtown because we want to be safe and secure. We don't want to have to worry about our car getting broken into or our things getting stolen. We take measures to protect ourselves and our families and our possessions. That's why the home security industry is a $15 billion a year business and why the insurance industry is uh, a $1 trillion a year business. We have layers of passwords and uh, security and fingerprint buttons on our phones and computers now and sometimes I can't even get into my accounts because I forget the password to this one I thought it was the password to that one and they want to send a text message to this number that I had 15 years ago but it, it's it, it's all for the purpose of giving us security right if you've ever had your identity stolen or had a, a credit card fraud charge come up that's jarring if you've ever had your house broken into that leaves you with a sense of uh, uncertainty. As we think about things going on in our world, whether we know friends or family in Houston who have had their lives turned upside down, we hear of North Korea testing more missiles and bombs, and there's all these things that can cause us to fret and worry. When our security is threatened, it rattles us, doesn't it? And when I was in high school, I uh, was at my favorite pizza place one Sunday night, and I was walking out of the restaurant holding our leftover pizza, and this car pulled up to me, and they, the guys in the car asked me for directions, how to get somewhere, I forget where, and I told them where to go, and the driver opened up the door and pulled out a gun and said, one more thing, give me all your money and your pizza. <laughs> I realized later that I gave him the wrong directions, so that <laughs> may or may not have contributed to him pulling the gun on me. But seriously, I, if you have a gun pointed in your face, that's scary. So he, he took my keys and my wallet and my pizza, and I ran back in the restaurant. My parents were still in there, and we ran out and called the police and all that kind of stuff. I don't think they ever caught the guy. But that night, I was rattled. Uh, this was over 20 years ago now. I, I was uh, in high school. I didn't sleep that much. And, and if, if I think about it now, it still kind of gives me chills, this feeling of insecurity. And 
the truth is God made us to long for peace, to long for security, to long for comfort. So I think it's right and good to, to pursue these things, to long for these things. But we'll see in our text that true and lasting peace doesn't come from more locks on our doors. It doesn't come from more passwords in our bank accounts. It doesn't come from keeping a gun under our pillow. In Psalm 122, we'll see that true and lasting security comes from being a part of God's people, living in the very presence of God, rejoicing under the rule of the righteous king. So let me read this psalm for us, and we will get into the text. Psalm 122, a song of ascents of David. I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Our feet have been standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. Jerusalem built as a city that is bound firmly together, to which the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord as was decreed for Israel, to give thanks to the name of the Lord. There, thrones for judgment were set, the thrones of the house of David. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they be secure who love you. Peace be within your walls and security within your towers. For my brothers and companions' sake, I will say, peace be within you. For the sake of of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your good. Let me pray, and we'll dig into this psalm together. Father, I pray that as we walk through this psalm and seek to apply it, that we would walk away from here filled with hope in Jesus, our King, our Deliverer, and our peace. So help us all to do that. In Jesus' name, amen. So as we walk through this psalm together, let me give you a little bit of context. As Pastor Jason mentioned, I I like to think in terms of the whole story and the whole message of the Bible. And really, as we think about this psalm and think about how we need to read it today, we do need to keep the whole story of the Bible in mind. So these psalms are grouped together with what are called the Psalms of Ascent, if you're not familiar with the Psalter. From Psalm 120 to Psalm 134, there's this group of about 15 psalms that Jewish pilgrims would sing and recite as they would travel back to Jerusalem for the Passover and other feasts. So they're ascending to the Temple Mount. That's why they're called Psalms of Ascent. And and all of these psalms are focused in one way or another on God's promise to live with his people, to dwell with them in a particular place, namely, as our psalm talks about it, Jerusalem. And to understand and apply this well, we also need to understand the place that Jerusalem plays in the whole story of the Bible. We'll come back to that. This is also one of the four psalms of ascent that are specifically said to be psalms of David. You notice in the heading there, King David wrote this psalm. And I think it's important to keep this kingly context in mind. We don't want to forget it as the psalm unfolds because David himself points to a greater king. So as the pilgrims traveling to Jerusalem would sing these psalms through the years, uh, it's likely that they would sing this psalm in particular when they saw the city, when they laid eyes on the city, maybe when they're, they're just getting up to the walls of the city. They're getting close to the place where God's presence rested with his people. So let's keep some of those pieces in mind as we move through this together. And as we walk through the psalm, we'll see the foundation for our security, as I said, is living as a part of God's people, living 
as a part of God's people who dwell in his presence. As a part of God's people who dwell in his presence under his glorious and gracious rule. So in Psalm 122, in the first two verses, when David says, I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Our feet are standing in your gates, O Jerusalem. We don't know exactly when David wrote this psalm, but it seems like he wrote it around the time that he brought the Ark of the Covenant into the city. So if you've read the Old Testament, David's reign was marked by two different periods. For the first few years of his reign, the Ark of the Covenant, the place where God's special presence was to be among his people, was outside of the city. But then in 2 Samuel 6, he brought the ark into the city. In in 2 Samuel 7, God makes David these glorious promises that his son will reign forever. So we could unpack that for a long time, but we won't this morning. The point is, this psalm was probably written around the time that David was beginning to comprehend, perhaps in a new way, what it means to dwell in in God's presence. Why there's such great joy in going to the house of the Lord. David was beginning to understand the joy and the security that always comes when God's people are dwelling with him. That's what we were created for, right? If you don't know, Again, the story, all the way back in Genesis, Adam and Eve were created to live in the very presence of God. They intimately knew the God who made them, who loved them, who cared for them. And and that's what we are all made for. As people who are made in God's image, we're made to know him, to live in his presence. But Adam and Eve were thrown out of the garden, away from God's presence, when they sinned against him, when they turned their backs on him. And you and I, if we sin against the God who made us, which all of us have, that keeps us from the very purpose that we are made for, doesn't it? It keeps us from his presence. But the glorious story of Scripture that we've celebrated in our songs and in our prayers and in our readings already is that God has not left us to ourselves He did not leave his people alone outside of the garden, but rather he called a people to himself. He brought them out of slavery when they were in Egypt later in the story. And when he did that, he gave them just a little glimpse, a little taste of his presence. And and that's when we learn about the Ark of the Covenant, that God's presence is dwelling with his people in this little spot in the midst of the temple that they were building. It's a reminder that our separation from God because of sin is not the last word. The fact that David could celebrate going to the house of the Lord was pointing forward to a greater promise when God's glorious presence would not always be limited to the temple, the ark, or Jerusalem. Later in the Old Testament, the prophet Habakkuk tells us of the day when the glory of the Lord will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. In other words, Habakkuk 2.14 is telling us that the presence of God will fill the earth. Not in an ark or a temple or even a garden. It will cover the whole earth. And so we can can stop there and take comfort in the fact that God's commitment to dwelling with his people in his creation is not over. There's no doubt we live in a broken world. The things we've seen this week remind us of that. The, The flooding and devastation in Houston The ongoing tension between countries remind us that we live in a broken world, but we, in the midst of this broken world, can live with rock-solid confidence that no matter how broken it may look, 
no matter how broken your life might feel right now, you can have confidence that God's presence with his people in this psalm and then throughout the Bible reminds us that God is making all things new again. If you want to think about a foundation for true security, this is it. That God will dwell with his people. That God is the one doing it. That it does not depend on you. God is the one who takes the initiative. He is the one who lives among his people. It is God who is at work. And so you can begin to understand David's joy to go to the house of the Lord. See, this is not merely an invitation to go to church for one hour or an hour and a half on a Sunday morning. It's a call to fulfill the purpose that God created us for, this call to go to the house of the Lord. It's a call to, to live in God's very presence, the thing that he made us to live in and enjoy in and bask in. I think David understood how important God's presence was for lasting peace and security. You see, around the time that God was making these glorious promises to David and that he brought the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem, David also asked God to build a permanent temple, a house for God's presence to live in permanently with his people. But God told David it, it wasn't him, but instead his son who would build the temple. So the king is the one who builds the temple. I think that explains the emphasis that David puts on the rule of the house of David in the next section. So in verses 3 through 5, he says, Jerusalem built as a city that is bound firmly together, to which the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord, as was decreed for Israel, to give thanks to the name of the Lord. There, in Jerusalem, the place where God's presence dwells, there thrones for judgment were set, the thrones of the house of David. So not only God's presence with his people in the temple, in the house of the Lord, but also the house of David, the king. So this connection between the temple and the king, it's not just that they both happen to be in Jerusalem. It's the other way around. The reason that they were both in Jerusalem was the important connection between the two, between king and temple, between the king of Israel and building the temple, bringing the presence of God to his people. If you're familiar with the early chapters of the New Testament, King Herod understood this. Do you remember King Herod in the early chapters of the New Testament? He built a temple in Jerusalem or expanded the temple because he knew, and everybody knew, that the king, the true king, is the one who builds the temple. It was his claim to be the true king of Israel. But Herod wasn't a descendant of David, and he wasn't exactly the kind of king that brings the peace that we see here in this psalm, was he? In fact, just the opposite, right? He tried to murder Jesus. He killed many infants because he saw them as a threat to his kingdom. So Herod didn't unify God's people the way this psalm describes. Rather, David is stacking up these descriptions of the city, a city firmly bound together, a city that the tribes of Israel go up to, a city where Israel gathers to give thanks to the Lord. And all of these together emphasize the unity of God's people under his loving care in his presence. The unity is under the rule of David and his descendants, right? 
the tribes of Israel. So God's people were united. They were at peace and they were at rest when David was on the throne. When the king was fighting for them. When the king had united them. So again, we see it doesn't depend on them. Their safety and security does not hang on them. God's presence among them did not hang on them. Their security did not hang on them. Rather, it was entrusted to the king. The problem, though, was that David and Solomon and king after king after them were not able to bring the peace and safety that we see here in this psalm. Solomon's son David reigned for about 40 years, and even though he had amazing wealth and wisdom, soon after he died, the kingdom split, and the unity of God's people was shattered. God's presence departed from his people, and eventually they were taken out of the land into captivity. So with all of that context, think about an Israelite living under the divided kingdom, going to Jerusalem, singing these psalms, longing for the king to unite God's people again. Or a Jewish family who had returned from exile in Babylon or Assyria, longing for the son of David to rule as king again or Jews in the first century living under the Roman Empire, praying for God's kingdom to come to give them lasting peace and security. They were praying in all of these scenarios for a rescuer, a king, a messiah. And the glorious truth is the son of David The Messiah, the rescuer, has come. Our King Jesus has come. He's now reigning at the Father's right hand. He has united God's people, not just the divisions among the Jewish nation, but rather divisions between Jew and Gentile, rich and poor, male and female, young and old. We are all united under the just rule of Jesus. So as you look around this room, think about what unites us together as brothers and sisters. I'm a Michigan fan. Go blue. (laughs) I had one affirmation, thank you. Your pastor somehow is a Notre Dame fan. I don't know how that happened. But still, we're we're united in Christ. We're brothers. God keeps bringing uh, Ohio State fans into my life. (laughs) I've had, everywhere I've lived, I've had a friend uh, who's an Ohio State fan. And we've become close friends in spite of our differences. Because we have something greater in common, right? We we have different jobs. We have uh, different living situation, some of us have kids, some are married, some are single, some older, some younger. But none of these things is the source of our unity, and none of these things is the source of our security. Apart from Christ, there's nothing that would bring this particular group of people together into one room at 1142 on a Sunday morning. If this were a social club, It wouldn't look like this. If this was any other kind of gathering, there'd be no common thread to unify us. But we're united under the rule of the house of David, namely our King Jesus. And more than any other label that you have, that ought to shape your identity. You are, if you are trusting Jesus alone, if you are a part of his people That is your first allegiance. You are a part of Jesus' people. He is your king. And he, not your cleverness, not your righteousness, is the lasting source of peace, the lasting source of security. 
And one day he will return, and his kingdom will never end. And we will have unshakable peace, security, safety. I'm getting a little ahead of myself. So we'll step back and think about the two pieces that we put together so far. Where we find God's presence, the house of the Lord is where God's presence dwells. And where we see God's anointed king from the house of David, we find true peace, lasting security. So then look at verses 6 through 9 in the last part of our text. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they be secure who love you. Peace be within your walls and security within your towers. For my brothers and companions' sake, I will say, peace be within you. For the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your good. So David's prayer for the peace of Jerusalem was really a prayer for God to live with his people and for his throne to be established forever. The Israelite pilgrim's prayer for the peace of Jerusalem was a prayer for their covenant God to return, to live with his people again, and for the house of David to be established forever. So the security and peace of Jerusalem is built on this promise. God's presence among his people and the reign of the king David. And then notice also that this peace belongs to all of God's people. It's significant in verse 8 that David says, For my brothers and companions' sake, I say this. So he's turning outward and looking at the community, the congregation as a whole, and say, peace doesn't come as individuals. Peace comes together. When we talk about true security, we can't talk about it as individuals accomplishing something for ourselves, by ourselves. Yes, we must each put our trust in Christ alone. No one is saved because of someone else's faith. But we are rescued to be a part of a people. God is committed to saving a people not just a bunch of individuals scattered around in our bunkers like doomsday preppers. Have you ever seen that show? I've, I don't think I've ever actually watched a whole episode, but I watched a few clips of it. And I, and I went back and watched a, a recent one where a guy spent $7 million building a house that is totally secure, safe from fire, safe for intruders, totally off the grid, energy independent, all that kind of stuff. He's got everything you need there, food, water, air filters, enough toilet paper to last for years. He also built uh, what he calls man traps to keep people out. That sounds a little scary. And, and he puts up these man traps, whatever they are, because he recognizes that we live in a broken world. So he's trying to find true security by retreating from other people. Now, here's the thing. First of all, all of our doomsday prepping won't protect us from the greatest dangers that we face, will it? The greatest danger that we face is not zombies or nuclear war, famine, disease, Really, the greatest danger that we face doesn't come from outside of us. It comes from inside of us. Sin, that when we are left to ourselves, leads to death and separation from God forever. No matter how much we spend, this enemy will eventually run us down apart from Christ. But here's the good news. The king... The anointed king, the descendant of David, has gone to the cross. He defeated sin by dying the death that we all deserve. 
and he rose again victorious from the grave. He ascended to the right hand of God where he's reigning as king today. <coughs> God, excuse me. He's doing this for us together. He's called us together to be a part of his united people. You see, unlike the doomsday preppers, this true peace is experienced when we not run away from each other, but run toward each other in the community of God's people for our brothers and companions' sake, seeking peace, not putting up man traps to keep each other out. So don't forget that as you think about your security, your salvation, your peace, true and lasting security comes as we live in his presence together, brought under his rule, brought into his very presence. So the psalm ends as David reflects on the truth that the good of Jerusalem, the good of the house of the Lord are all linked together. When the Lord is present with his people. So that was the prayer of this psalm year after year. That the Lord would return to Jerusalem. And when the Lord returned to Jerusalem, wasn't exactly what some of the travelers singing this psalm would have expected, was it? In John chapter 4, Jesus is sitting next to a well outside of a Samaritan city about 35 miles north of Jerusalem. He began talking with a Samaritan woman, a Gentile woman, the woman asked Jesus about the presence of God in the temple in Jerusalem. You see, the Samaritans had set up an alternate temple. They wanted to try and worship God in a different place, but Jesus confirmed that the temple in Jerusalem is or was the place where God met his people. You see, the answer he gives him to this woman is shocking. He says, a time is coming when you will worship the Father, neither on this mountain in Samaria, nor in Jerusalem. The hour is coming and now is here when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. In other words, God's people no longer had to meet him in a particular place, but instead in a particular way. This was revolutionary. Sometimes we forget how revolutionary this is. Jesus is saying that God's special presence among his people was no longer limited to a temple in Jerusalem. The need to travel up to Jerusalem singing these psalms of ascents was no longer there. The need to find true security in Jerusalem as a place was coming to an end. How in the world could he say this? Well, Earlier in John's gospel, John tells us how Jesus, the living word of God, became a human being and dwelt among us. You may have heard before that the word translated dwelt or lived among us is, is unusual. It's closely related to the Greek word for a tent or a tabernacle. Uh, John is saying that the word became flesh and tabernacled among us. In other words, the word became flesh and brought God's presence that was in the temple to his people. Wherever Jesus is, God's presence is among them. God himself came to live among us. That's why Jesus could talk about the temple of his body in John 2.19. That's why Jesus could say he was greater than Solomon in Matthew 12, 42, because he is a greater king who, bring, who builds a greater temple. Solomon built a temple for God to live among his people, 
But Jesus himself brought the presence of God in a new and greater way as the living tabernacle. So if we understand this, it changes not only the way we think about our safety and security, but it also changes the way we think about our mission as God's people. Do you remember in Matthew 28, if you're familiar with the New Testament, Jesus told his disciples at the end of Matthew 28, at the end of Matthew's gospel, to go to all the nations, to the ends of the earth, making disciples. And the power and the motivation behind this commandment is in Matthew 28, 20. I am with you always to the end of the age. So this is God's presence. Jesus brought God's presence and security to his people, and so then he also sends his people on this mission with that same presence, with that same security, with that same longing for peace that pilgrims to Jerusalem were praying for year after year after year. It's been given to us, and we can go and take it to the nations. So as Jesus builds his church, God's presence fills the earth. That's why Peter can say we're living stones built up into a spiritual house. The point of the temple, the house of the Lord, was to bring God's presence to his people again. And as the church of Jesus Christ is built, that purpose is being fulfilled in new and greater ways. So our work of mission and evangelism is actually a kind of temple building, right? We're united to the King Jesus, the true temple builder, and we are his workmen building that great temple of God's people from every tribe and tongue and nation. And so this project is underway, but it's not yet finished. It won't be finished until the end of the age when God finally and fully makes all things new. In the last chapters of the Bible, we get a glimpse of that in Revelation 21 and 22. His glorious presence fills all of creation. His people live with him forever. Finally, Again, we're brought back in a greater way for the very purposes that God created us for. And if your eyes are open to this glorious vision of God's presence, it should motivate you to call others to join, to join in the experience of God's presence right now through Jesus and in the age to come when he makes all things new. So that is where we find true peace and security. So there's a sense in which we can read verse 2 of this psalm. Our feet are standing in your gates, O Jerusalem, and really mean it right now. We have everything that Jerusalem was meant to give God's people. Lasting peace and security. If we're a part of God's people, united by faith to our Messiah, Jesus, then we are secure in the presence of God. So where do you look for security? Where do you run to to find peace of mind? Peace of mind. To get rid of anxiety. Don't think of your pat answer. I mean, you you go to church, so you say it, Jesus. Think about it. Where do you really find comfort, hope? Is it living in a safe neighborhood? Having enough in your bank account to be comfortable? Making sure your children are getting a good education? Making sure that you're advancing in your career? Whatever you want to put in that slot, None of those things will ultimately bring you security apart from living as part of God's people under the gracious rule of our King Jesus. So yes, lock your doors, get insurance, change your passwords, be wise, all that sort of thing. 
but don't think for a second that those are the things that are going to give you security that lasts. We all long to be safe. We all long for peace. That's a good thing. And true peace comes from being a part of God's people, living with him under the rule of his king. And then we can have peace and security and safety even when somebody does put a gun in your face, even when your bank account goes into negative, even when you lose your job, even when your physical safety is threatened and you're thrown out of your house, you still have peace, security, and safety in and through Jesus. When your hope in Christ is secure, you can rest in God. And the other things will not matter as much. Believe this. Live in light of it. Let it transform the way you think about everything. Let me pray for us.